Right now, I'm gonna show you how to use one of these viewfinders to make better landscape drawings. But first, I'm gonna drink some of this coffee because I only slept one hour last night. So you might be asking, Marley, if you only slept one hour last night, why are you out here filming a video? Well, that's because, because the Nature Journal show must go on. <laughs> Can't complain too much, a little bit sleep deprived, but got a beautiful day out at the coast. And I'm gonna show you how using a, one of these frames is gonna make your landscape painting so much better. So the first thing that you can do with them is you can use them to help you des design the layout of your page and um, draw the frame for your landscapes. But I can look at how that will go on the page and they can, the rectangles that you draw around them, tracing them, can even be a design element. So that is definitely one downside of this style. Um, this style, it has clear plastic in the middle. You would not be able to trace it. And so you would not get that functionality out of it. This style where the middle is cut out, um, that kind will work. And this clear plastic kind um, that's cut to the exact size of the frame, that will work also. But wait, aren't you gonna tell us where you bought those or how we can make one of those? You get some of this salad mix at the store. Then you have to eat it. Not quite as fun as eating chocolate on camera. You have to carefully peel these stickers off. No! Next, measure and trace the shape and the size that you want for your viewfinder. Next, carefully cut out the shapes with an X-Acto knife. I like to put a dark outline around the viewfinder plastic. You can also put marks for thirds that will help with your proportions. The next thing that you do with your viewfinder, and this is the most important thing, hence the name viewfinder, is you find your view. And uh, the main benefit of this is it forces you to decide and to crop. And um, it's hard for you to see this concept right now because you're looking through a frame that's already cropped due to the nature of this camera lens. But when you're looking with your normal eyes, you see a much wider frame than this. And that can be problematic because on the paper, you can't fit that type of um, a point of reference, a, a point of view. So your field of vision is a lot bigger than what a camera sees or what you can fit on paper. With both eyes, you can see between 200 and 220 degrees. Your binocular vision is a little bit less at 120 degrees. And most people in their vertical can see 130 to 135 degrees. This is way bigger than what you can fit on a small drawing. So we have to artificially limit what we see, such as this pink range here, and fit that onto the paper. Otherwise, things will get left out, distorted, or weird in your drawing. You know, and photographers, they don't have to deal with this problem because they have the frame built into their camera. But as artists, we do have to deal with that. And so having a viewfinder helps you make decisions about how you're gonna crop something. And uh, then you can actually uh, become more disciplined about what you fit into your frame. So you'll notice that it's, oh, it's, it's pretty small what you can actually fit into there. And um, that is a good thing because that's realistic. And it forces you to bite off a smaller chunk. So you can see here, there's a lot of interesting rock subjects um, that I could do in a landscape format. There's also this really cool um, different ice plant patterns over there, even though it's an invasive species. Uh, the colors are interesting. Um, capturing a little bit of that beach. This angle, this uh, frame right here would be pretty cool. Um, getting a little bit of the beach and a little bit of the water. And um, But what I actually want right now is um, a vertical frame. Ooh, look at that. So choosing things that are interesting um, to you and trying to find that good composition is important. You can see I've, on this um, viewfinder, I've drawn 
some reference lines onto there showing the halfway mark and also um, approximately the thirds. Um, and that makes it easier for me um, when I'm transferring this to my drawing, especially if I, I make the marks on my drawing. And um, it's really great when you trace the frame um, onto your paper because then you have the exact same proportions as what you're looking at. Whereas normally, if I were just looking at that with my eyes and then coming down here and drawing it here, I have to kind of make that up. Um, and in this case, my ratio is going to be the same. And then I can use these reference marks to kind of figure things out. So for example, um, that rock that's in the water there, um, you can see it lines up right in the middle near the bottom and it's below the halfway marks on the sides. So that will help me place in the correct point, in the correct place in my drawing. Whereas um, that pointy rock in the top that's in the, in the mid ground there, that one is a little bit between halfway and the third um, to the left. And so then when I'm tracing in my drawing, I can use those reference points. So I'm actually gonna use this one right here. Um, it's the, this plastic has gotten a little bit scratched from um, being on my Grand Canyon trip. It got scratched from sand. So the visibility through it's not that great, but that's not actually that important, especially when I'm not filming through it. So I'm gonna go ahead and spend a moment here um, looking for um, my first landscape drawing that I'm going to fit into this frame here. So let's see, what do I want? I kind of want to do something not too complicated. Um, I do, I think I do want to get the ocean. That white water is going to be challenging. I kind of like the way it looks way out there, um, getting that atmospheric perspective of the receding um, land back there would be really cool. Um, Let's see, the other thing is, of course, bringing it closer to your face, it makes a bigger frame. Pushing it further away uh, makes it smaller. It's like zooming out, basically. Um, zo zooming in, zooming out. And let's see, maybe I'll get something like that. Um, so the second thing that you do is you, ch you use your viewfinder to help you make decisions about what would be a good composition. And that's really helpful. You can also do the thing with your hands. And I always teach this in my classes, but a lot of people don't seem to like doing this when they're out in the world. But I guarantee you, if you practice doing this and choosing just better compositions with your landscapes, that is the most powerful thing you can do to make your landscape drawings better even before you start drawing. Okay, so I got my major elements in, and now um, what I'm going to focus on, now that I got the composition and the basic elements in here, um, in the correct positions, now what I'm going to focus on is start looking at lights and darks. And while I'm still working with my ink, I can put in some of the light and dark before I get to my watercolor. Because after getting the composition and the um, placement, right the next priority is value so light and dark and at this point um, you might not really need to be looking through this thing anymore unless you forget where you are and so I'll just stick that into the top like um, or you can stick it under your clip right here I kind of ran out of buff titanium in the Grand Canyon. I need to replace, replace that for sure. OK, 
Okay, as usual, starting with your uh, KOS colors first and watercolor. Okay, now I'm going to do purple back there once that dries to show that there's a receding into the distance. A lot of times if you draw the, the background element purple, even if it doesn't look purple, or maybe like blue, or you can see here I use the same wash that I'm using for the sky. I covered the very furthest background ridge with that same blue color. That makes it look like it's further away. In this case, it is that same blue color. And that's called atmospheric perspective. And if you understand that, you can exaggerate it and make things look like they have depth in your painting. Okay, now I think stuff's dry enough for me to come in with the, um, the ocean color. And I'm gonna try to get it dark right off the bat. So I'm gonna use my really dark green color here um, and Danthrone green, I mean, Paraline green. Um, and I'll probably just combine that with like, I don't know, maybe I'll use the, um, uh, what's it called? Ooh. It's not the ultramarine, the manganese blue hue. I like to use manganese blue hue a lot. So I'm going to mix that in. Um, and that's looking pretty dang good already. So manganese blue hue combined with that um, perylene green makes a perfect dark ocean color for me right now. And I'm going to try to get it dark right away so I don't have to do a second wash on it. Uh, maybe a little bit darker. Throw in a little bit of damp on blue too. Go straight to it. Let's get to it here. And then I'm going to come back later with the white and I can come back later with the rocks as well. The white water and the rocks um, can happen later. And this paper I'm using, this is the, I think this is the Zeta series from Stillman and Burn and it has the smooth paper which is not ideal for watercolor. Um, it's too smooth so what ends up happening is you get all this uh, much more brush stroke shows up as opposed to if there's a little bit of tooth on the paper, the brush stroke does not show up. So I probably could have reserved the whites, but a lot of times with this kind of ocean scene, it's easier to paint all of the dark ocean and then paint the white water on top of that. You know what I'm talking about? All right, more coffee while well, that's drying. Okay, now this is probably dry enough back here where I can do one really pale layer um, for my furthest background element there. That furthest background element needs to stay uh, very distant seeming. It's gotta be distant. So I'm gonna take a little bit of this purple and tone it down because if the purple is too saturated, it's not gonna work. Make sure it's not too dark because that's the most important thing is the value. So I'm testing it on the little strip here, and let's see. Oh yeah, perfect. That's perfect. Maybe could have done even paler, but I'll I'll go with it. I will go with it. Okay, yeah. Look at that. That's gonna be good. Okay, now I'm gonna start. I'm gonna start darkening some of these other foreground elements. Um, and rocks and uh, think a little bit, I'm gonna think a little bit about local color, but I'm not gonna worry about the local color too much because that distracts from the most important thing, which is value. Looks like my ocean is dry. So I'm gonna use some of this um, really dark um, brown. This is one of the coolest colors, the Bloodstone Genuine. And I'm gonna mix that in with some other things here, um, some other colors. And uh, let's see. It's weird because these rocks, um, what's dark and what's light, doesn't really have to do with shadow. It has to do with how close it is to the water. And like the rock that's in the water more or closer to the edge of the water has a lot of muscles growing on it and um, maybe some chemical weathering going on that's different that makes it darker. So it's hard to um, create an illusion of depth with the rocks or just use kind of your own knowledge of shadows for the lights and darks on the rocks here in this particular situation. So uh, it's important to pay attention to what you're actually seeing. 
Um, sometimes it's fine to fake things, but you have to really know what you're doing before you start faking things. It's always easier to it's always easier to do it um, from what you see, not from what you think you see. Okay, a little bit of dark there. Now I can do the ice plant. Um, the ice plant is not green. Uh, not all plants are green. A lot of it's actually um, this reddish, orangish color. So I'm going to use some of my uh, quinacridone sienna, which is a great one. Get that ready um, because I'm going to do some wet on wet while I do this. And then I'm going to get um, serpentine genuine, which is my favorite green. As you can tell, it's almost all out. So I'm going to get some of that ready, and I have this um, more saturated green uh, that I'm going to add a little bit of that, this phthalo yellow green, add a little bit of that, or I could just add some of my yellow straight from um, the corner of my palette here. That's perfect. So now that that's ready, I think I'll put this down into the background and then drop the uh, quinacridone sienna on top of that. So let's come in here for that ice plant touch. There's one big green patch in the front, and then the red stuff is mostly behind that. Come in here. All right, now I'm going to clean my brush quickly before I grab that quinacridone sienna. And this will work differently depending on um, the paper texture, too, which is unfortunate because I don't have that working with me in this sketchbook. So now I'm going to kind of add that in and I can already see that it's not working as well as I would like due to the paper texture or lack thereof but I'm just gonna flow with it. Uh, practicing watercolor on smooth paper is sometimes good because you don't become dependent on that texture to do all the work for you or you don't become dependent on wet and wet to do all of the work for you. It's, it's more like drawing. Okay so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add a little bit of this other really cool color um, uh, shoot, I'm blanking on it right now, but uh, put that one in a couple spots here. It's one of my favorite colors, actually. I think the sleep deprivation is affecting my uh, memory of my colors. Oh, yeah, how could I forget Naphthamine Maroon? Okay. Now um, I'm going to come back in and you can see here that these um, rocks are still the uh, pretty pale color, one of the palest colors in the foreground elements. So I need to change that. Oh, I forgot. I should put in, um, there is distant um, ice plant. So I don't want that to be as saturated, as warm, or as dark a value as any of the foreground elements. So be careful, your eyes are really good at noticing local color to the exclusion of other elements. So don't forget to um, get the value first. Okay, now I'm gonna come back in and make these darker. So I'm gonna use a little bit of this. I think this is the um, Monte Amiata Natural Sienna. I'm gonna come in and use that to darken um, these, woo, it's a little bit too warm of a color for what I need, but I'm just going to go with it, and it's looking a little bit dark, but I need, um, the rocks don't look this dark in real life, but I need to get these darker, um, otherwise they're a little bit too close in value to, like, the sky, which is not right. Ooh, and there's less contrast there, which is not great, but um, okay. And I got the sand, still looks like a slightly different color, um, so that's good. And there's there's actually like one more other gray in here, but I don't think I'm going to deal with that. I think I'm going to put one more dark, like really, really dark, um, straight from the, straight from the uh, watercolor there, direct pigment, um, to push some of these dark spots here. Um, this can be really fun and you can overdo this part, so make sure it, um, it's showing kind of these major shapes and not just like annoying details that aren't really actually necessary. And don't do those really dark darks anywhere except the um, foreground or else it will take away. Like maybe you could tone it down a little bit and add some dark, whoa, see that's too dark. Um, 
that makes that come forward and it actually needs to be um, in the mid ground there. Okay, I might use my water to kind of soften the edges of this a little bit. Just soften those edges a little bit. All right, that's good. Okay, so now the only thing I need to do now is wait for this to dry and then I'm gonna add in my um, white gel pen, which the water might be dry enough for that already. So that is um, the drawing almost finished. I just need to add in a little bit of white for the white water with the gel pen. But you can see that um, this is a perfect example of a place where if I tried to do a landscape showing all of that, I would still be um, working on it right now. Um, and if I um, tried to do a landscape Ito um, and was smart enough to do something small, you know, like this, modest size, but I didn't have one of these viewfinders, um, I would face other problems. So um, doing something small and having a viewfinder is definitely the best way to go. Um, you will, you know, learn a lot faster and you'll get good at um, cropping and making these decisions about what to do. So right now you're probably wondering, can you use your viewfinder for other things be besides landscapes? And I'm going to show you how. Oh no, the friggin' gel pin, man. I think the gel pin kind of ruined it. And you can see one major no-no when using gel pins for your whites in watercolor is if you reserve some of the whites and then you use gel pins for the other ones, you can see the color difference. Same applies to if you use two different types of gel pin as I did in this example. So, uh, gosh, that kind of sucks um, at the end of a painting to ruin it with the uh, gel pins really easy thing to do um, obviously there's a lot of white out there so it'd be really hard to reserve all the white but I think something that I want to um, aim for as a goal in improving my watercolors is to be able to reserve all the white instead of having to use um, gel pins and you know like I've tried all these different kinds and they all kind of suck when it comes down to it they're not the greatest art tools or the most dependable when they work they're great and it's kind of like a a quick fix and a good cheat um, for a little highlight but um, if I can if I can teach myself and learn and practice uh, reserving the whites then I'll be way better off for more landscape drawing tips check out these videos bye